Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we still have many people coming into the WebEx, so we'll wait about 30 more seconds or so, and then we'll get started. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I am here to uh, welcome you to our WebEx presentation today that's presented to you on behalf of uh, the MDH Health Regulation Division. Um, this is a collaborative effort between both our, our state and uh, federal sections to give you the information related to bed rail and assist assisted device safety and regulation. My name is Daphne Pons. I am uh, the interim executive operations manager for our state programs as well as OHFC director. And our two presenters today are Matt Heffron, regional operations manager over our state programs, and Kathy Lucas, uh, who is a regional operations manager with our federal section. And uh, we are recording this presentation for your colleagues that may be unable to join today, um, given that Monday is a holiday. I would anticipate it might be Tuesday before we could get this posted, uh, the recorded presentation to our website, but that will be available as well as the slides. Um, we do have a chat function here that you are able to use, but we will be saving questions and answers until the end. Uh, and again, I just welcome you. I'm glad everyone is here today to um, participate. And we will be able to give you some more information about where slides will be posted. I see that in the chat and we can put that information um, out for folks that are attending. Um, but I'm going to now uh, turn this over to Matt Heffron to begin the presentation. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, next, please. So our agenda for um, this webinar is looking at bed rails in similar assistive devices, looking at overall risks and considerations, a quick look at use of them as a restraint, and then we're going to look at them from the perspective of the licensing laws for several different uh, specific facility types. Uh, I'll be covering assisted living facilities, and then I'll be handing over to my um, colleague for um, some of the federally certified provider types. Next, please. So for general considerations, we know that bed rails and similar assisted devices can be part of an effective and a safe plan to support residents. However, all of these devices also create a risk of entanglement and strangulation, and they can also increase the severity of falls. In addition, these devices can have the effect of being a restraint if they're placed in such a way that they limit uh, the resident's ability to get in and out of bed as they choose. Next, please. Over the last few years, we've really come to understand that there's two completely different ways that we encounter bed rails in the settings that the Department of Health regulates. One of them is hospital beds uh, with their built-in bed rails and um, the considerations around those. And the other are consumer bed rails, which are typically aftermarket um, commercial off-the-shelf shelf type products, which are attached to the resident or client's existing um, consumer bed. And so it's not part of an integrated system the way the hospital bed is, uh, but often can function and look very similar. The reason this is important is that those two categories are then regulated in very different ways. Next, please. When we look at a hospital bed, something that's designed as an integrated system and marketed for the medical market, 
that's um, specifically designed for healthcare settings, and they are um, medical devices that are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration or FDA. So these are, we refer to them as hospital beds, but they're also up, um, may exist in many other different types of settings. Whenever it's this type of device that's marketed at and regulated as a medical device, then we're treating it as a hospital bed and applying that the standards that the FDA has in place for those devices that they regulate. Next, please. On the other hand, the consumer bed rails include numerous types of side rails, grab bars, and similar devices that can be installed on any type of bed. They may or may not be a hospital bed. They may or may not be considered a medical device at all. For the most part, um, these bed rails are simple consumer products. Anybody can buy. Huge amount of them are available on Amazon. And as equipment, then, they are regulated by the Consumer Product Safety Com Commission not by the FDA. And so a little bit different standards apply. However, the same risks as we've known for many years exist with hospital beds do exist with these consumer products. The Consumer Product Safety Commission has a report titled Adult Portable Bed Rail Related Deaths, Injuries, and Potential Injuries. And that indicated that from January 2003 to September 2012, there were 155 deaths that were related to these type of consumer bed rails. 143 of those were due to some type of entrapment, generally leading to strangulation, and 11 of them were due to falls. Falls occurred when the victim fell off of the bed rail or attempted to climb over the bed rail or fell and hit the bed rail. All of those 11 fall events resulted in death. And this, uh, this is one of our significant concerns with these type of products is that the individual does have the ability to and chooses to climb over them it really just increases the height from which they're then falling or potential things that they can fall against. So there is that history of deaths related to falls that, that consumer bed rails contributed to. However, again, the bulk of the deaths were due to the entrapment and strangulation risk. In addition to all the deaths, however, the study indicated that there were 36,900 emergency room visits between January 2003 to December 2011 related to consumer bed rails. Uh, many of these included fractures, lacerations, or, bru or bruising uh, related to these same type of incidents with consumer bed rails. Next, please. So general principles um, in all provider types, and then we were really looking across the board from nursing homes to assisted living facilities to other facility types that we'll mention later on, if you are using hospital beds, devices which are regulated as medical devices, it's important to follow the FDA guidelines for bed rail safety, assess whether the device is appropriate for the individual, and educate the individual and, and their families and other decision makers when that's appropriate on the risks versus benefits of the device. For all other assisted, assisted devices that are attached to beds, one of the first things is know whether the device has been recalled by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. There are several different versions of these, uh, including many that we still find out there in facilities or on the market um, that actually are subject to a recall due to incidents that have happened with them. So the first item is know if it's been recalled and also whether the device is installed according to manufacturer's guidelines. To know whether it's installed according to manufacturer's guidelines, of course, that means you need to find and have a copy of those manufacturer's guidelines and take a look at how it was intended to be used and whether it's been set up the way um, that it's intended. Of critical importance is assessing whether the device is appropriate for the resident or client considering their cognitive and their physical status. So do they understand what it's there for? Do they know how to use it? Um, what's their bed mobility like? What's their physical strength? Are they going to be at risk for climbing over it and falling out? Um, are they able to effectively use it? Um, are they at risk of rolling around and getting themselves entangled in it? All of the components related to both their mental status and their physical uh, mobility uh, is important to determine whether the device is appropriate for them to use. And then educate the resident, and again, including their family and other decision makers as appropriate, on the risks versus the benefits of the device, taking into account um, that the known strangulation risks, the known um, fall risks, and other potential issues regarding using them um, in, in their particular setting. 
Next, please. So to expand a little bit on hospital beds. Again, hospital beds are medical devices, so they're regulated by the FDA and should be used in accordance with FDA guidelines. There's a couple of different specific FDA resources that include recommendations for healthcare providers about bed rails, and then the guide to bed safety and bed rails in the hospitals, nursing homes, and home health care. Um, those are both great resources. We'll also show you later in the presentation, the FDA has another couple of um, clinical guidelines and a brochure related to it, all of which contain kind of say, different versions of this same information. All of this guidance references a recommended assessment practice created by the Hospital Bed Safety Work Group um, back uh, about 15 or so years ago, uh, and including representation from a nursing home administrator here in Minnesota that many of you probably know. Um, and that recommended assessment practice includes measurement of seven potential zones of entrapment. Now, in today's um, webinar, we won't go into a specific training on how to do that recommended assessment practice. We need to keep in mind that there's some specific parameters uh, that exist in, in those guidelines regarding uh, what, how to measure it, where to measure it, and when to, um, whether to uh, compress the mattress to make the, the measurement, and some of those general ideas around how you re determine uh, that uh, what the potential gaps are, and potential zones of entrapment. Even if you are not using hospital beds, it's worthwhile to take a look at this as recommended assessment practice from the hospital bed safety work group. We won't be evaluating to that specific standard if we're not talking about a hospital bed, but it gives you a good idea of how to look at the way a, a rail is installed on a bed and determine uh, what, what gaps pose what potential risks and take a look at that general idea of how a person could become entangled in the rail and um, get themselves injured that way. Next, please. So when we're looking at other beds and different types of rails and assisted devices that can be placed on them, the FDA guidance does not directly apply. Um, however, uh, first consideration again is that several types of these devices have been recalled by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. So, for example, the picture that you see here is from a recall notice from CPSC that indicated that there had been, um, I believe it was two or three deaths of, associated with this particular device. And you can see from the way it's installed there uh, that there is a gap between the mattress and the vertical bar. And what it was occurring is people were getting their neck trapped between the mattress and that vertical bar and causing a significant injury that way. And due to the nature of how this one was installed, it wasn't possible to completely eliminate that gap. And so the device was recalled as not being safe for use. Many similar devices are still on the market, but you wanna make sure if one exists in your facility that you know whether it's subject to one of these recalls and uh, educate the resident and their family about the fact that that uh, item shouldn't be used uh, because it's been found by the appropriate federal authorities to not be um, safe for consumer use. Next, please. So, manufacturer guidelines are critical when we're talking about these consumer products. There's a great diversity of potential consumer devices. They look very different. Some of them look like very standard bed rails. Many of them look like the picture we saw on the last slide. Others of them look like a single vertical pole. Uh, and I've seen a number of other different possibilities. Because of that diversity of potential devices, uh, it's, you can't know ahead of time what all the risks are. It's critical to know how the device was designed to be used. So you and you have to be able to determine if it was installed correctly according to that intended use. So you need to have those instructions or guidelines available to you so you can determine, is this installed correctly and is it being used the way it was designed to be used? If you don't have the manufacturer guidelines available to you, you cannot determine uh, fully whether or not it's being used in a safe manner. And that's going to be uh, in uh, potential for ongoing risks um, because you simply won't have the right information available to you to determine uh, whether it's safe to be used or what the uh, residual risks might be. Uh, many of these manufacturer guidelines are available online. So if the if there's not a paper copy um, that came with the device, uh, you may be able to download it from a manufacturer or find it somewhere else 
online, or you may be able to contact the manufacturer and get uh, PDF versions sent, things like that. Um, having it in any form is fine as long as you're able to look at how it's intended to be installed and how it's intended to be used and determine from there what the risks are uh, for the use of it in your setting. Next, please. So for both hospital beds and these consumer devices, documented assessments are critical. Care planning about bed rails should start with the intended purpose of the device based on that individual resident or client's needs. Again, as we talked about before, the first part is cognitive status. Are they cognitively able to understand what this device is for, um, how it's intended to be used, uh, what the risks it poses to them, what they should and shouldn't do with it, um, whether they have that understanding or not, um, that many of the resources out there and standards of practice will indicate that the greater a person's level of confusion or not being oriented to their setting, the less likely one of these devices is going to be appropriate for them. Then, of course, we're looking at physical strength and mobility. Um, for example, a bed rails of limited uh, uh, use if the person doesn't have the ability to reach out and grab it and pull on it. Um, it might you might be taking into account their fall history. And, it might, and of course, we want it to be part of an overall plan of looking at their fall and their bed mobility potential um, and how it fits into the plan of uh, reducing falls or and of dealing with appropriate bed mobility to avoid pressure injuries. Part of that also often is how it fits into incontinence and toileting plans. Um, so those need to be taken into account as you're developing that plan. Uh, if the resident is someone who gets up many times in the middle of the night, um, for that reason, that could be a consideration in how the device is going to be used. And finally, as we hinted to at the beginning, uh, the device has to not have the effect of being an unordered restraint. Um, under both Minnesota law and oftentimes the applicable federal regulations, we have um, issues related to that whole question of unreasonable confinement or um, the, as it's referred to in the Minnesota Vulnerable Alts Act, for instance, and other, uh, other regulations regarding how restraints are applied. If you're putting on the bed rail for the purpose, for example, of keeping the person in bed, um, that is, uh, that's a, something that's concerning. Uh, anything that's intended to be used or is being used uh, as a restraint needs to um, have an appropriate order behind it and needs to be consistent with the licensing laws related to your facility type. Uh, if you're using a bed rail without an appropriate order um, as a way to keep the person in bed, um, that might be a unreasonable confinement or unordered restraint type issue. Next, please. So overall, um, we're looking at risks versus benefits. We want to consider resident preferences, and then again, that hold both cognitive and physical status to know how they will use the device, and then an individualized assessment of risks. Can it, um, what are the risks of this person getting entangled in it? Is this someone who's likely to climb over it and have a fall? And um, look at it on a person by person basis of, of what the risks are for that particular resident or client. And then, of course, document your education of the resident and their family of the risks. We certainly know that there are situations where families or residents insist on having a device present where uh, you wouldn't have thought one is necessary. When that occurs, um, having that conversation with them about here's what some of the risks are and what we're going to try to do to mitigate that um, are all things that it's very important for you to not only do, but to document. Next, please. Any assessment, whether we're looking at the consumer devices or the hospital beds, needs to include a physical inspection of the stability and the condition of the device and the potential areas for entrapment. So in any of these consumer devices, the device has to be securely attached to remain safe. Gaps between the mattress and the device are usually um, are most, le most lethal risks. So on your assessment, you wanna be able to describe areas that have openings large enough for a body part to be trapped. Again, if you're talking about the consumer products, the specific FDA measurement standards may not apply, 
but you still might want to measure some of the components uh, as part of your overall safety plan of, oh, is this something that the person's head um, would fit through? Is this something that their arm is going to get stuck on? Uh, and have some of those ideas uh, in mind uh, as you're doing that assessment. It's critical then that the person who has that responsibility for doing a comprehensive assessment does put eyes on the device and think about is, is there a way that um, this, do I know if this device was installed correctly? Was it installed according to manufacturer's guidelines? Does it seem like it's stable here or is it loose? Is there gap, are there gaps um, or could gaps easily be created by the things um, sliding around? Um, those are all things that you need to be part of the assessment. So it's key that the person who has responsibility for that assessment, usually you know one of your registered nurses, has uh, eyes on that device as part of the assessment. Next, please. So those are overall considerations. Um, taking a look specifically at um, how it applies in assisted living settings first. An assisted living resident has the right to receive care according to accepted healthcare standards. So in the case of a hospital bed being brought in, the accepted healthcare standard is that FBPA guideline. And so under that particular statute and the associated correction order that um, fits into it, uh, part of the expectation is that any hospital bed is used in accordance with the FDA guidelines and have assessments that follow um, those recommended practices. In the case of the consumer products, um, the part of the accepted healthcare standards are what we've talked about um, related to the Consumer Product Safety Commission and knowing whether the device is recalled or not and knowing um, whether it's installed according to manufacturer's guidelines, those are accepted healthcare standards. And of course, um, everything we've talked about are on the assessment front, documentation and education. We know, again, that there are circumstances where residents or their families want a particular device installed and they may have the, they do have the right to um, put certain items in their rooms. They do have rights to individual autonomy and to making their own decisions. And so they may choose to have a device there that you feel is not appropriate. It's critical in those circumstances uh, that you are uh, documenting their conver the conversations with them and making it clear um, what some of those um, issues might be. On that front of assessment and documentation, we know that an assisted living facility uh, is required to do the um, regular assessments. Those assessments on your both your 90 day requirement and um, the change of need assessments you have to use the uniform assessment tool created in Minnesota Rule 4659.0150. And one of the things that that uniform assessment um, tool um, has to include is that trans addressing mobility, including transfers and assistive devices. Next, please. So overall, um, again, if a res the resident has the right to make decisions about their living area, so one of the things that can happen is they, a device might be installed without you knowing about it. Uh, the resident could put something on their own bed. Oftentimes their family will put something on their own bed without telling you ahead of time. One of the things that's critical then on this front is that all of your care staff be educated to ensure that they inform your nurse when you see a new assistive device. Any staff member who becomes aware of that assistive device uh, needs to know that that's one of the things that has to be reported up the chain um, because even if it's installed by the family without them knowing, uh, without them telling you ahead of time, once you do know about it, you're responsible for knowing whether it's safe and appropriate for your resident. So once it's there, you're going to want to go in and do an initial assessment. So whether you were involved in this installing it or not, uh, once you know it's there, you're going to do an initial assessment uh, that covers the items we've looked at so far. If you include, if you conclude that the device is not safe, uh, one option is you might offer alternatives to the resident, uh, encourage them not to use it. Uh, you can certainly discuss, offer other interventions to mitigate safety risks. You wanna document your assessment and all of those interventions that have been discussed or offered or attempted. And if you use a negotiated risk agreement or similar, 
You must maintain documentation of your offer of alternatives, everything you're implementing to mitigate the safety risks, and of course, conduct ongoing reassessment for the appropriate use of the bed rail. Keep your assessments up to date on that. Keep information on how it's going for the resident. And we know that there are circumstances, again, where the individual is going to insist on using something uh, that is not safe for them. And what's important for you, though, is to keep doing your job on the assessment front. There doesn't need to be a conflict between their right to make those decisions and um, your responsibility uh, to continue uh, assessing the situation, educating them on the risks and benefits. They may still choose to make um, that decision, but as long as you are documenting um, your attempts to make it safer and your attempts to educate them on the risks, then you're doing what your responsibility is. Next, please. All right, so at this point, I'm going to um, turn the presentation over to Kathy Lucas, who's going to outline some of those particular rules that um, apply to uh, federally certified providers and how some of these concerns might be cited in those settings. All right, thank you, Matt. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna repeat basically what, what Matt has shared, but I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the provider types that we routinely survey that the Department of Health on the federal side does routinely survey. And those include um, home health agencies, hospice, intermediate care facilities, and as well as nursing homes. Next, please. So under the federal home health agency requirements, bed rail safety may be reviewed under one of the following conditions. And again, in, in the case of home health, as well as hospice and ICF, um, bed rails aren't necessarily called out specifically. However, um, the criteria of assessment um, and the criteria that, that Matt talked about would be looked at under one of these areas. For home health, we would look at uh, the assessment under the comprehensive assessment of a patient. We may be looking at patient rights um, and patient protection if there was a neglect issue identified. We may also look at care planning, coordination of services and quality of care. And this is an area that you know, would focus on, has the physician been informed? So is it on the plan of care as well as is it on the care plan? Um, and also it may be looked at under skilled professional services. Next, please. And under the hospice requirements, <clears throat> excuse me, bed rails uh, safety may be reviewed under one of the following conditions. And this again is very similar to what we would look at for home care. Um, that would be patient rights. Again, initial and comprehensive assessment of the patient, interdisciplinary group or care planning coordination of services. And then at 418.110, hospice that provide inpatient care directly. This specifically calls out uh, the possibility that the bed rail may be used as a restraint. Next, please. In addition to a hospice and home care, we would also look at this um, for the ICF and areas that we may focus on for Bed rail use in ICS include physical environment, client protection, um, again, that would be uh, client rights, as well as health care services. Next, please. So as Matt, um, this basically is, is a duplicate of one of the references that, that Matt had provided earlier, and that is in regards to the FDA requirements. Um, and Information on that site uh, is, includes safety concerns about bed rails, uh, recommendations before installing bed rails, as well as following manufacturer's recommendations. Next. Um, so as Matt talked about, it's very important that, that uh, providers assess and again reassess as part of the comprehensive assessment, uh, the patient and residents for safety and appropriateness for bed rail use. This link that I provided here was really is really a great tool and and resource um, that again I that, uh, Matt also alluded to earlier. This is a guide that provides um, 
the provider really a, a, a comprehensive tool to um, including the guiding uh, principles for bedroll use, the patient assessment, patient risk for entrapment, risk benefit assessment, and education of the patient on the risk, as well as um, possible policy considerations that any provider that is is um, using um, or involved with bed rail use would want to have those policies um, in place. Next, please. So, in addition to hospice, uh, home care, and ICF, the other area that I want to talk about is, is the nursing homes. And under the federal nursing home requirement, bed rail safety is reviewed under 483.25. And this specific regulation is, is very detailed um, under these, this requirement. I also uh, included a link to the state operations manual. Um, and that is appendix PP that you can go into and, and find that specific requirement next. So, the 1st requirement um, is detailed at 483.25, and this is that the facility must attempt to use appropriate alternatives prior to installing a side or bed rail. If a, if a bed or side rail is used, the facility must ensure correct installation use and maintenance of the bed rail including but not limited to the following elements. So the first is that the assess, assess the resident for risk of entrapment um, from bed rails prior to the installation, review the risk and benefits of bed rails with the resident or resident representative, and obtain an informed consent prior to installation. So that's an additional piece uh, for the nursing home. Next, please. Uh, in addition, um, the provider needs to ensure that the bed's dimensions are appropriate for the resident's size and weight. And again, that was um, an area that Matt discussed as far as measuring for risk of entrapment. And then again, following the manufacturer's recommendations and specifications for installing and maintaining bed rails. Um, and, and specifically, um, and also I just wanted to call out, these are just, a, you know, the, the brief description, but the SOM for nursing home really gives you know, very in depth interpretive guidance on the use of bed rails um, for the nursing home provider. Next. All right, that was the um, all I had for, for the federal side. And we have some time for questions. All right, thank you, Matt and Kathy. Now, I've seen several of uh, questions in the chat, and I'm going to let Matt and Kathy maybe scroll through the chat if they see a few items they feel they can address. Um, I do recognize that there has been some on and off beeping for those of you that may be using your phone. I apologize if there's been some interference. Um, I know while we've been on the computer, there hasn't been any beeping that we're aware of. This is a recorded presentation that will uh, be posted to the assisted living teleconference webpage. The slides are already there. We are also uh, uh, planning to put a link off of our main HRD uh, webpage as well. Um, so you will have access to the recording. That should be a clean recording with no beeps um, or additional sounds. I do also want to recognize, I don't believe I said at the beginning, that our federal and state surveyors uh, and investigators are on this call as well. Um, even though they have been trained to these standards, we wanted them to uh, be a part of this as a joint training between our staff and the providers, and so they could uh, hear the same information, have this as a refresher. Okay. Hey, so Matt, I don't know if you've located maybe one or two things you'd like to address. Yes. So I think um, the first question I see is uh, one, does MDH have a recommendation for a consumer bed rail that is least likely to cause harm? And certainly we can't endorse any particular uh, product out there on the market. I would, I would say um, that the key thing is looking for things that are less, whatever is least likely to create gaps between the um, mattress, especially around the head area. 
Um, I know the, the statistics I gave earlier are US wide as far as injuries. To speak to Minnesota specifically, since, since I've been here at the Department of Health, I know we have had a handful of deaths in Minnesota related to these type of devices. And to my knowledge, all of them or nearly all of them have been people who slid out of bed and compressed their neck against a vertical rail of um, the device uh, on one side and the mattress on the other side. So the more securely the device attaches to the mattress and reduces the probability of that happening, um, that seems to be our, our major way that it's actually resulted in a death. Um, there certainly could be other considerations in mind of what's practical to use in your facilities, um, but from just a strictly safety point of view and worst outcomes, that's, that's what we see. Um, one, one question, another question I'm saying is, does the, uh, facility need a physician's order, um, for a bed rail? Um, no, not necessarily. That may depend somewhat on provider type, but certainly in our, um, assisted living facilities, we wouldn't necessarily expect a prescriber order for these consumer devices. Again, they're not regulated as medical devices, uh, and people do, have the ability to buy and install them. And if you assess that they're safe to use them and, and have been installed uh, correctly, um, that that's fine. Um, another question, why must the family be educated on the risk if the resident is responsible for himself? Uh, they they don't. It, that The comments related to educating the family um, are primarily related to the situations where uh, the family has purchased and installed the device. And so they have, a stake um, in it, or they're advocating for the device to be used, which is certainly something uh, we see. Uh, but we're, if we're looking at the scenario of a resident who is their own medical decision maker, and um, that's certainly also a conversation that can just happen between the nurse and that resident, and that's that's totally fine. Um, I just mentioned the family component related to um, when it's the family who's advocating for it to be put there. Uh, it may be appropriate for the for the facility to respond by letting the family know what some of the issues might be with installing it. Man, I just wanted to comment off of, I, I'm going to speak specifically to the federal regulations for home health. Um, bed rails would be required to be placed on the, um, the plan of care for the um, home health agency. And um, basically any devices or any um, assistive devices that the patient uses, it is a requirement that we inform the physician of that. Thank you. Um, one of the one of the questions that's in the chat is what's the responsibility and liability of the facility installing the bed rail versus family installation. I think that um, at the end of the day, there might not be a great difference in your responsibility there. In either case, um, you're going to need to know if it was installed according to manufacturer's guidelines and whether it, um, it, it looks like it's going to be able to use safely as designed. Certainly, if your own staff are installing it, um, that would initially heighten um, your responsibility for making sure you do have the manufacturer's guidelines and you know whether it's appropriate to um, be set up and whether it's co compatible with that bed and can be securely attached the way it's designed. Um, but once you know about it, whether you installed it or not, um, you're going to want to visually inspect it and determine uh, whether you believe it's been installed correctly and it's going to be able to stay um, set up in the in a safe manner. So, uh, for initially, you know, obviously, if you're doing the the installation, that's that's definitely a heightened responsibility then. But in the long run, um, whether you installed it or not, um, you're responsible for at least knowing how it was installed and whether it's, it seems to be set up in a way that's safe for the resident. Uh, one one item 
um, that is in the chat that I know is a really somewhat a complex question. Um, I, I mentioned assisted living residents and families having the right to put things in the residence room. And if the assisted, if the family or the resident installs one of these assisted assistive devices, and then the assisted living facility decides that it doesn't appear to be safe um, for the resident, the assisted living facility can do all of those steps I talked about, offer alternatives, document. Um, but then there are some instances where it appears facilities were still cited for a negotiated risk agreement as constituting an illegal waiver on behalf of the resident. And this is one of those things that's complex in the assisted living law and that we're still um, certainly working with um, some of the nuances of how it's uh, uh, interpreted. But the bottom line is the assisted living laws state that there can't be any waiver of facility responsibility for the resident's safety. So a negotiated risk agreement is and allows you to document that you've done the right thing on the front of assessment and um, things related to educating the resident on the risks versus benefits of what they're doing. Uh, but to the extent that that negotiated risk agreement um, purports to disclaim any tort liability for what happens afterwards, um, that's something that the facility can't do. And that's just based on the plain language of the statute saying you can't waive facility responsibility um, for the resident's safety. Now, um, I am not going to give legal advice to any facility, but I'll certainly um, throw out that now, in the event that you were in a um, some type of litigation over that issue, I certainly would hope a court would also take into account all of those measures that we take into account on the assessment front, as far as that you documented that you offered alternatives and you did the best you could to to balance resident safety issues um, versus the resident's right to autonomy and to make their own healthcare decisions. And so whether the facility is ultimately held liable or not is a whole different question. Um, but I don't believe that the facility can, if there is some, uh, whatever narrow band of liability or responsibility the facility still holds, even after doing those things, um, we, it simply can't be waived based on the, on the language of the statute being that you can't waive any responsibility. Heck, you can't have any waiver of responsibility uh, for resident safety. So again, I don't think in the long run, uh, the presence or absence of that waiver probably makes a difference in your actual tort liability, but I'm no expert on that subject. Um, I would say we're just looking at it from the point, point of view of the, the plain language of the statute regarding waivers um, versus um, understanding you know, that uh, it's difficult to, to look at when a resident is choosing to do something that you know isn't safe. Yes, we know it puts you in a difficult position, um, but um, the documentation, assessment, and education are the key items from our point of view. So I know that might not be a complete or satisfactory answer, but I, I hope that gets some of the considerations on the table for that. Um. I seen one of the questions was in regards to um, bed rails being assessed and again, that's going to be dependent on the um, frequency of the assessment in assisted living Matt, I think that is every 90 days. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and that would be done initially. Now it again, that's going to depend on each in federally. That would be whenever a comprehensive assessment would be required um, at least every 60 days, you know, in for skilled. As well as, you know, initially, and then with a change in condition is when that would need to be assessed. Yeah, and for assisted living, it's, it's. Really, the same consideration any time um, that you're doing an assessment that would trigger that requirement to use the uniform assessment tool. So both resident change in need or the 90 day assessment. Um, it, it has to address mobility. Um, and so, and including devices used for mobility, uh, and we consider that to include um, bed rails and similar assistive devices. So we would expect that to be addressed um, on every 90 day or ch any change of need assessment um, for assisted living. Very, very similar thought process to um, what Kathy just said about the comprehensive assessments. Um, in addition, there was a question regarding obtaining informed consent for positioning bars in the uh, skilled nursing facility. 
And I would say that anytime a, a rail is attached to the bed, it would be considered, uh, you know, either, you know, it's a side rail or a bed rail. Um, that wouldn't would also require the um, informed consent and to follow all the re requirements or the criteria that were mentioned under skilled nursing facility. So it looks like there's a couple of questions related to finding the manufacturer's okay. guidelines. Um, and am I saying that you as a facility need to find the manufacturer guidelines for any consumer rail that might potentially be installed? Uh, it, roughly, the answer would be yes, um, because without um, having those manufacturer guidelines and um, the, how are you going to be able to determine if it's installed as intended and being used as intended, it'll be difficult to accurately um, assess um, the that uh, without that information. If you were to find a device um, and you can't identify the manufacturer of it and can't find that, um, then that would be something we would um, hope to see in your documentation of your education of um, the uh, resident or the resident's decision makers is, hey, we found this device um, in your room. Um, these type of devices do have some risks. We um, we don't know what kind it is or, or if it's installed correctly, so we can't fully assess that risk So, and, and talk to them about whether they still want it under those circumstances. There also was a question regarding the websites men mentioned. Uh, when this is posted, yes, you'll be able to access those um, from the recording as well as it was posted, and I believe, um, Daphne, you had included the link to where it is posted above in the chat, and um, then you will be able to access once it is, um, and actually you should be able to right now because it has been posted to that site, and so you should be able to um, access those links um, um, right away. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and thank you, Liam. Lynn has put the, the slides and the PowerPoint presentation actually in the chat for those of you that are able to access it. Um, she also put for assisted living, there's an assisted living resources and FAQ page. Uh, there are approximately 20 uh, FAQs specifically related to bed rails, uh, and they do also go over uh, the FDA requirements for uh, bed rail safety. The links are provided there for hospitals, nursing homes, home health care, um, and recommendations for health care providers about bed rails. And so there are um, several bits and pieces of information and links that we've provided and we continue to build, I suppose you call it a library of FAQs on our website. If there are other items, um, that you think would be useful to have in an FAQ, please let us know. Um, and you can do that by emailing the assisted living email box. We can also see if there are other um, FAQs that should be added to our federal website pages as well. And you can just uh, email and let us know. I do see there are, I think we, we have a few more minutes. I see there are a few more questions. Well, thank you, Lynn. Lynn has also put the um, for the assisted living folks, you have put an email address in the chat that you can email our assisted living email box with additional questions or concerns. And there are several questions, so I'm just running through them as well. I don't know if Kathy or Matt, if you see others that we haven't already answered. I think uh, one of them, there's a, there's a question that says, if a resident does not receive healthcare related services, are we required to assess the bed rails? I think the answer to that might vary somewhat by facility type. Um, to speak for assisted living, I would say, if you do have a housing only resident um, where you um, see that type of device, you don't have a standing assessment requirement on that housing only resident. So you would, only be responsible for that if you had um, actual knowledge of some particular risk and would, to the extent that you would be, you know, neglecting them if you didn't address it, 
um, but you wouldn't have any specific regulatory requirements related to assessment of someone who's a housing only resident because you don't have any recurring um, requirement to um, do a comprehensive assessment of them anyway. And I'm not sure if you addressed this. Um, what was the question regarding? Are you saying that we as a facility have to find manufacturing guidelines for any consumer rail family might potentially install in a residence room? Um, yeah, and I think on that again. Uh, my position would be if you can't find the manufacturer's guidelines, if you don't know who manufactured it and isn't, um, that makes it difficult for you to assess whether it's safe or not. Um, and that needs to be a component then of the risks you are educating the resident on. on and um, as far as, hey, we, we don't know how this is intended to be used. I don't have any specific directions about how it's supposed to be set up. Um, and so, you know that that's a that's a risk in and of itself um, that the that there needs to be um, education on. And I think you had mentioned. I mean, for the most part, many things are online. But yes, if you can't find it, it might be an older device. You can't um, determine what it is. And as Matt said, you would have to include that as part of your as part of the risk. I think there was also a question regarding um, the hospital. If um, maybe you want to take that one. Yep, I can start. The, I can take that one. Um, uh, hello, everybody. So I know Pam Maltrude put uh, some information also in the chat regarding hospitals. We do look at the health and safety of a, of a uh, patient while they're in the hospital. And of course, there's no specific guidance that's identified in there, but hospitals have a large condition. Condition is called um, patient rights and safety. And that is the area that we would look at for any um, potential issues with side rails and that component as well. Um, it does not, as Pam identified, negate the hospital to ensure safety of the patients. So we would look at that when doing surveys for hospitals. And that um, specific regulation that we would look at would be under A, the 144, and that's specifically for um, patients right to be safe, uh, to receive care in a safe setting. Thank you. All right, so I see there's two questions related to how uh, how would you know if a, if the device is installed correctly um, if if you're a nurse and that kind of thing's not your expertise. Uh, I think that's why we we emphasize like trying to get the manufacturer's guidelines if possible, so you have a resource to look at. To say here's here's how it says it's intended to be used, and um, the um, it should be in, installed following those instructions, and and that's all we're saying we're we're holding the person to as far as installed correctly is um, whatever the directions say of secure it to this or or um, bolt it to that as long as it's generally in keeping with those instructions, that's that's fine. Um, but what we have, what we've seen out in the field, are devices where the manufacturer's instructions say put this loop around the bed frame, and instead it's just like slid in under the mattress, and it's really not held there securely at all. Um, so those are the kind of things we're looking for, where um, you know it's it's grossly contrary to what. Um, the way it's intended to be installed and in a way that makes it not secure and therefore um, greater risk of entrapment than um, if it was being used as designed. And yes, if you have facility maintenance people that can assist with that mm -hmm. and um, be involved in um, us assessing those or, and trained to measure and assist the RN, um, you know, it's, it's always, you can always use other staff to gather data that, that then fits into your comprehensive assessment, right? So that's, that's totally fine if you have that resource to, to use it. 
I think there was also a question and I'm not seeing it now in the chat, but it was how often the aides or staff should be looking at the bed rail and it was daily, you know, weekly. You know, I, I it's important to have bed rails on the aides care plans on any caregiver that are taking care of a, a person. Um, you know, that's using an assistive device such as a bed rail and I would just indicate that if there's any change or any concern with the bed rail between the time that the nurse is doing their assessments or that the nurse is seeing that patient that that needs to be reported to the um, to the nurse, you know, recorded up any concerns that they might identify. There's no specific requirement as frequency, but again, based on change, based on concerns, identify if something came loose or if they're noticing, it's important to train your staff too, you know, on what what these concerns are and hopefully some of those staff are hopefully attending this training today as well. This was a, a seeing several questions related to it says home care client has commercial bed rail of some type in order to assess this. Are they considered comprehensive now? Um, I'm trying to make sure that I'm understanding that question. I, yeah. it, it's not based on, I mean, you would look to the, the provider providing the services as for the licensing type. Um, and where the services are coming from. Matt, I don't know if you have. Oh, Kathy has something more to say on you that. Know, I, I'm not quite understanding that. I'm sorry, that question. If, if we can maybe. Um, I think and to the extent that you're talking about like uh, a state home care client who, um, you know, they're receiving low level cares, okay, someone's saying like a basic client and they now have a side rail, do they now have to be considered comprehensive? Uh, I would say no, not necessarily. If they're in, especially if they're putting that rail in on their own for their own purposes and you're in that home care setting, it's, it's not your facility. Um, you're responsible for what you're contracted to do and the services that you're there for. Now, it might be, it might still be the responsible thing to do as a healthcare professional to talk to them about, hey, why do you, why do you have that there? Um, you know, it, you know, that that does pose some risks. Do you know about that? Um, but you are, you are not um, increasing your level of care for them um, because they put in un, um, something that's unrelated to that. Now, if, if you install that device and you're doing, um, then and you're doing a comprehensive assessment related to them, then that's that's a whole different um, component about now you you you're involved in placing it there. But if you're not involved in placing it there, you just notice it. That doesn't change their uh, and it's not otherwise changing their home care needs. Um, I, I wouldn't think that that can. I don't believe that can, makes them then a comprehensive client um, or change their assessment requirement. Um, merely because you observed it, or even if you do choose to educate them um, on those risks um, at, um, for their benefit, um, but you would, um, you're not thereby taking on some responsibility for it that you don't already have. I think that probably will have to be the last um, question that we tackle today, but we do save this chat history so that we can look at what questions um, that we didn't get to um, and we hope that we can get some further resources out related to it. Yes, I just want to thank everyone for attending today. We recognize that this can be a complex issue um, as far as um, the requirements are concerned and the guidance. And we will look, as Matt said, look at the chat and we will attempt to answer as many questions as we can. Um, and add to our FAQs um, so that we can provide the most education that we can. Really the intent um, is to just make sure that we're providing uh, safety for the residents. And so uh, we hope that this was helpful to you. 
I know it also spurred some additional questions. Please reach out to us and we will do our best to answer your questions and we'll make this presentation available as uh, soon as we can after Monday being a holiday. Um, I anticipate we'll be able to have the recording up next week for your reference. Um, again, thank you to Matt and to Kathy Lucas for being here today and putting this presentation together. Um, also, thank you to Jia Vang and Lynn Knight who are behind the scenes helping with our technology and making this possible for us. Uh, look forward to uh, hopefully being together again on future presentations. And thank you again for attending today.